In this section, we start by defining the domain behind our image uploading service. In this section, we're going to see how to define a domain object in JPA, and then we'll craft a Spring Data repository to simplify interacting with the data. Now let's move into the first video, where we'll define a domain object using JPA to capture information about an uploaded image. We're going to look at the steps necessary to define a JPA entity, and then we're going to implement the required constructors plus some additional convenient constructors. We'll wrap it up by adding the necessary getters and setters to interact with it using our IDE. Here we are where we left off with our uh, shell of a project without any business logic. And to get started, let's go ahead and create that domain object for the image. We're going to create a new Java class. We'll call it image. Now for JPA entity, it always starts with adding the entity annotation to our class. Now objects stored in relational databases need primary key. So we're going to define an ID value and give it a type of long. For JPA, we need to flag this field with the at ID annotation. Now something to further help us manage the entity objects is we're going to let it generate unique primary keys for us as needed. Now the other piece of metadata we're going to have in this course is to actually add the name of the image. Now it's possible to go add lots of other metadata that may arise with this domain object, but for demo purposes, this is all we need. Now for JPA, we do need a no argument constructor. No argument constructors, while required by JPA, are not the most effective way to interact with our domain objects. So that's why we've marked it private to discourage usage of it. Frameworks may need it to populate objects, but we don't want to write any business code dependent upon this constructor. Instead, we're going to provide a more convenient constructor call. So this way somebody can initialize the name object directly with it. Now you'll notice we didn't add the ID field. When you actually save a new entity object into the database through Spring Data, it's going to lean upon Hibernate to auto-generate that ID value for us. The other factor in all this is that the Spring Framework in general recommends using constructor injection. It goes along with the concept of initializing the object in a consistent state and not putting yourself at risk of being in some inconsistent state. Now the last step here is to generate some getters and setters. So I'm going to pick this from the IDE. I happen to be using IntelliJ IDEA, but all modern IDs, IDEs come with this feature. So now we've defined the core attributes for our domain object and how to access and mutate their values, as well as initializing it. 